Great. Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Natalie Appleyard. I work with Citizens for Public Justice and I'm a co-lead of the Dignity for All campaign. And I'm joining you today from Ottawa on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. And I'm grateful to, uh, to their caretaking of, of the land um, and recognizing that Ottawa is also home today to many different First Nations and Inuit and Métis people. Um, and um, we're, we're grateful for their care of, of these lands. Um, I'd like to welcome Sue Gwynn from Poverty Talks in, uh, in Calgary and Paul Bailey from the Black Health Alliance in Toronto. And I am just going to um, give them a chance to introduce themselves a little bit and share with us uh, what brings them to this conversation today about um, meaningful consultation and accountability in talking about poverty and poverty eradication in Canada. So uh, Sue, I'll invite you to go ahead first. Hi, I'm Sue. Um, I live in Calgary. I was actually just saying that originally I'm from Ontario, but I live in Calgary and I've been here for 16 years, so I guess that makes me a Calgarian. Um, I work with uh, Poverty Talks and um, our sort of parent organization is uh, Vibrant Communities Calgary. And we are a lived experience um, or a lived poverty experience board that directs the enough for all strategy. So the anti-poverty strategy for the city of Calgary. In that, um, it's our job to be, stay connected with um, people who live in poverty and bring their voices to every table that we attend. And that is, it's a challenge, um, but it's meaningful. And the accountability side, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that it's not enough to engage. You also have to weigh what you're doing against um, pretty much the measures, the standards that um, the community of human beings that live in poverty expect and uh, being from Alberta, we're having some problems with that right now. <laughs> and that's it. Cool. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Bailey. I am the executive director of the Black Health Alliance. Uh, most of our work here is uh, in Toronto at the moment. Uh, and I think it's also, you know, prudent to, to, to acknowledge that we are here in Toronto on the lands of the Mississaugas and you credit the Ashinaabe, the Wendat peoples, and the Haudenosaunee uh, traditional territories. Um, uh, the Black Health Alliance really works to improve the health and well-being of, of, of Black communities. And um, part of our, our work over the last while has been really around um, how, do we, how do we convene and, and bring people together in, in, in you know, better and more impactful ways so that we can you know work towards uh, uh, achieving that outcome of improving health and, and well-being and, and thinking about uh, you know the accountability portion of that conversation um uh, really working with with people with decision makers with uh communities themselves uh, around how we hold systems accountable to the to the issues that we all know and uh, um, you know again try to move that uh, that that piece forward uh, you know, just a little bit about my background. I am an urban planner. Uh, I, a lot of my work now focuses on mental health and well, um, well-being uh, uh, and just, you know, issues of, of neighborhood distress and, and, and inequality and come to the conversation around uh, poverty through, through some of that lens through the, through the work around improving health and well-being and through the, the work around uh, working in neighborhoods. Thanks, Sue, and thanks, Paul. Um, for folks joining us today, if you'd like to share in the chat where you're calling in from, um, please feel free to do so. Um, we'll save the, any questions uh, for a little bit later, and I'm going to invite you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for any questions, just so that helps us keep track of them all in one place. But if you'd like to share in the chat um, your name and, and where you're calling in from, uh, it's always nice to get a sense of, of who's here with us today. Um, and um, just to, uh, to share a little bit about um, this webinar series that we're part of, um, we're 
this is being hosted by uh, the two on this campaign, uh, which is led by Dignity for All, which is itself a coalition co-led by Canada Without Poverty, Citizens for Public Justice, where I work, and uh, Campaign 2000. And this year we were really grateful to have um, some consultation ahead of our uh, campaign uh, with some, some folks on the, on the call today. So um, we're really grateful for their uh, input in shaping the asks and our calls to action and, and how we're doing the campaign this year. Uh, so one of the things that we recognize in our advocacy work on poverty is that this is a really multifaceted issue. So we need to be looking at it from a variety of perspectives and considering a number of different um, issues all at the same time. Um, but what's really been hitting home re recently is that we need to be looking at all of these issues from an equity lens and from uh, a lens of anti-oppression specifically, because we recognize that systemic inequity is what causes and perpetuates poverty. and. Uh, and so today in our webinar, we're going to be uh, hearing a little bit from Sue and Paul about some of their insights and experiences about how we can bring meaningful consultation and meaningful accountability into our work when we are um, designing policies or strategies or solutions uh, to address poverty in Canada, even in how we do our campaigning and how we do our advocacy work. Um, because certainly the not-for-profit sector is um, by no means um, innocent of the kind of systemic oppression that pervades all of our systems. So um, I'm going to be inviting them to share their answers to a few questions and then we'll take some questions from, uh, from you folks who are attending and then uh, you'll hear a little bit more about the campaign asks and calls to actions. So I'm going to start out by ask, by sharing that, um, you know, we often hear that people are experiencing consultation fatigue with this government. You know, they've been asked to be part of consultations. They've, there have been surveys ad nauseum. And yet they're also feeling really frustrated with consultation gone wrong, if you will. They, they don't feel that there's been enough uh, representation, not enough time, not enough change resulting from all these consultations. So I'm wondering if you could provide some examples from your work or your own personal experiencing comparing what meaningful consultation looks like in practice versus some of the common pitfalls that we often see in the consultation process. Um, and I'll leave it up to you who would like to start that out. Go ahead, Paul. Okay, thank you for throwing me in. The, uh, you know, I, I think that's a big question. Um, uh, but the way that I think about consultation in, in, in my context, it kind of also uh, gets kind of lumped in with this idea of researchers and researchers doing work in, in communities. And I know that in the spaces and the communities I, I work in, uh, there, there is definitely a feeling of uh, consultation or, or research fatigue. Research and I think um, by far the biggest issue in that, in that is that, you know, folks feel that they are constantly telling their stories um, being asked to validate things that we already know, um, and and then either they don't they don't hear back about what that where that information goes, or it's not it's not used in a way that actually moves um, things forward. Uh, you know, I know that there are various different uh, things in, in, with regards to um, how things get moved moved forward, but uh, uh, you know that's one of the biggest things that I hear. What I like to think and or how we like to operate and, and think about consultation is um, we, we try not to go about it in, 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 in a way that is uh, just asking people to share their stories without having, um, for, on our end, done, done the work and the research to, 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 to find out what people have said before. Right? So, so we think it's critically important to come prepared to, to, to these consultations with, with you know, information um, already gathered briefing notes or or uh, a framework so that folks know in advance you know how they're coming to the conversation what they're what they're you know will be asked to to talk about how that information will be used and, and what it's in, in intended to what its intended use is I think the second thing you know that uh, we like to think about is you know oftentimes we we you know you know our work focuses on the black community so so we think that 
um, you know, the, the black community, a lot of folks don't know, understand or realize how diverse black communities are in, in Toronto, but, you know, across, uh, across uh, the, the country, you know, so we spend a lot of time making sure that we're thinking about who is at, at the table. Um, you know, our philosophy is we, we don't speak for people. We try and amplify voices and make sure that folks have ample opportunities to be involved in and, uh, you know, contribute to the processes the, the, themselves. I, I could go through a number of uh, other, you know, uh, things with regard to that, but I think I'll leave it there for now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so consultation fatigue is definitely a real thing. Um, because you have sort of this I concept an idea that came out a bunch of years ago that said you should have lived experience but in that there was no real how to's put out so it became this sort of we're gonna have these voices and it's a combination there there's two different versions of this either you're there but nobody really cares you're there and, and their plan is their plan and they're going to continue forward no matter what your input is. And the other one is that you are absolutely the most important thing in the room and everything you say should be written down and archived for future generations. And it's, it's a weird situation where you could have one or you can have the other, but you rarely get the middle ground. You never get, you're, a te you're part of a team. You're either singled out as being very sort of, eh, you know, yeah, we hear you and a pat on the head and move on, or you're put on some sort of a pillar and, and you know, it, it's kind of one of those moments where, you know, you're expecting an escort to the bathroom kind of situation and you go, what is this? But um, in e on either side, we have a lot, lot, lot of consultation going on and zero accountability to where that consultation, where that information is going. And on top of not being accountable to where it's going and how it's being used, but there's a lot of um, spins put on it. So you can gather information and you can spin it in whatever direction you want to spin it. So if you're gathering information to say, you know, uh, sort of promote your own agenda instead of actually listening to what is being said and where help is needed and, and those kinds of things, you can absolutely take that consultation and turn it into something that it wasn't. Um, and we've seen it happen. Um, and the, the worst parts of those it's sort of you're asking for people like Paul said to repeat their story over and over and over and over and over again and then you're taking you're almost stealing that story and using it in a way that the person who gave the story would have never ever agreed to if they had been told and that feeling of it's almost like um, it's almost stealing of stories it's the, the, we're going to use this story to, pr to promote whatever we want, not what this person would like to see in the future or how things could improve their lives. We're going to just take it and use it and it fits us. It fits us. And then they, and they'll go through and they'll pick out the scenarios which fit their agenda best and put those in and ignore the rest because the rest are unimportant and they don't fit in. So you see a lot of that and it makes people very wary of sharing their stories. Um, and that's part of the reason that, that you know, poverty talks exist. But, and then on the other side of that, you have somebody who's expected to sit in a room and do, you know, all of the sharing and all of this cons consultation stuff and at the end of it, they get a $5 gift card for Tim Hortons. And you kind of go, so not only did you marginalize them as a human being, you took their story and changed it to make your own purpose, but you also didn't compensate them adequately. 
so there's there's sort of all of these problems all in one and then for us for people living in poverty um that five dollar gift card might be something that is very important to them and they have no choice but and we go well that's that's not right and they go well they got something so whatever it's more than they had before it doesn't make it right not so thank you both i'm hearing some great points there about making sure that there's clear communication about how the information is going to be used uh, some accountability as to what is going to be done with it um, and Paula, I thought I really enjoyed your point about making sure that you've done your homework beforehand. Um, and I think we're hearing a lot of similar themes when we hear about uh, anti-Black racism work or uh, decolonial work that a lot of people are saying, you know, like, this information is out there. Do your homework first before you keep asking us for our stories and our experiences. And, um, and Sue, you mentioned sort of that mining of stories, that stealing of stories to, to be used for people's own gain. So thank you. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to this question of, of compensation. Um, I know that uh, often this comes into questions too of, of who can access these opportunities for consultation or who can participate um, comes down to whether or not there is compensation available or whether people have um, made accommodations uh, for transit or for the time spent there, maybe for childcare. Uh, so I wonder if, if either of you could speak to that, please. I can go first if you want, Paul. <laughs> so with Poverty Talks and VCC, um, we're very, very aware of the barriers and boundaries for people who have are, are living in poverty so we try um up until covid everybody's best friend um it, we could pay in cash which is a huge difference it makes a huge difference to people because like it or not um the amounts that we could give people as honorariums were clawed back by alberta works so the welfare system in pretty much any province will claw back 100% of what people are given. How does that benefit them? So up until COVID, we were, we were offering cash for a consultation. Um, we also, you know, gave a very good descriptor of why the event, what the event, who the event, where the event was going to end up. So um, when we did consultations about the low-income bus passes, for example, it wasn't just a, well, hey, what do you think of this? Yeah, we all think that it would be great too. And then we move on. It was much more than that and much more um, where, where on the scale, like where would you be comfortable? How would this work for you? You know, what about having to get it every month? All of these things, like you ask the questions sort of, and then from those questions, you build more questions and you say, okay, so you told us this, how about, what about this piece and what about that piece? And then um, we provide a, I think it's a living wage um, for childcare. Um, so we pay, we try to pay people Number one, we try to pay people at least a, minim a minimum of a living wage. Um, the second thing is we, we cover daycare at a living wage. Um, we, uh, we have, I personally have this sort of slogan that is, if you feed them, they will come. So, but it's not always, and, and, and this was sort of a thing that, that again, through consultation we learned, um, pizza is not the answer. Pizza is the answer to nothing. Um, honestly, from the beginning of September to the end of December, I eat more pizza than I even care to think about. But people seem to think that fast food is the answer. Shelters do fast food. They can't, people can't get, like the, the lived experience community can't get 
fresh fruits and vegetables. So that's what you need to have, fruit trays and vegetable trays. We learned this. Um, fresh sandwiches, things like that make a difference. Juice instead of pop. Always have pop as an option, but you know, all of those things, those pieces came from sort of long-term consultation and going, that didn't work. Pizza kind of sucks, you know, and, and listening to those people and, and getting that gauge. But then on top of that, um, also always doing an evaluation of your event. So we evaluate at the end, we send out, um, honestly being, being a member of Poverty Talks, I still get them. And sometimes I'm like, again, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. It, it was fine. I guess. I don't know. Don't ask me, ask somebody else. But even your hosts, your participants have a, a checklist to sort of say, how did we do this time? And every time it's taken, like they take in the data and then we look at it and go, how do we approach differently to, to hit these, check these things. Transit tickets are always offered for every single one of our events. It doesn't matter if it's something that we know is local to people. It doesn't matter if, if people walked there, it doesn't matter. We always provide two transit tickets for every participant and um, every, at every single thing. So it becomes one of those things where people know how they're getting there. They know how they're getting home. Um, and we always say it's one to get you home and one to get you back to us. So, and however they choose to use that is fine. Um, the other big things are, you know, in that we accept people as they are. Sometimes we've had people show up, you know, they've had a really rough day and they're not, they're there but they're not prepared, they're not ready to give a consultation. So instead of giving a consultation, you spend time caregiving with that person. You, you sort of roll with those punches because that's part of human life. And if you can't um, accept people where, they're, where they are and how they're doing, then you can't, you're never going to get accurate and proper consultation. Yeah, yeah, I, I think to, to this to this question, you know, the competition is 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 is, is one thing that, that's obvious and I know that you know it's not something that always can be done. Um, and, and in those contexts we really ask ourselves, um, do we need to be doing this? Um, and uh, if if we can't put in you know all the various different things that, that we need to do on, on the other side of the consultation is uh, I think the, the point that you raised, Natalie, around um, uh, accommodation, if you will, right? So, so uh, you know, a lot of the times we're asking people to come to us, and I, and I think we have to really think about how we uh, are, how we go to people or create that space for, for folks. And so there's a, there's a question in the chat around, um, you know, making sure that folks who are, who are neurodiverse are, are engaged and, and um, you know, included in, in these types of things. So. You know, I'm not an expert on, on any of these things by far, but one of the things that we try and do is to make sure that we have various different folks at the planning table. Before, you know, so if we're, if we're launching an initiative, we're launching a project, it's some, something that we have to, to consult on. We try and make sure that it's not just us around the table, um, you know, uh, setting up, uh, you know, these things that we have folks around the table that can, um, you know, call, call for us those red flags make sure that, you know, they're, you know, even on Zoom or, you know, if we're doing in person that there is, um, you know, uh, ASL translation, you know, there, there's a, a lot of work that we do around thinking, you know, sometimes it's, it's PowerPoint uh, round table discussion kind of thing. And, and that doesn't necessarily work for everybody. So you're going to have to try and find creative ways of, of engaging. So more and more um, we try and use design workshops. Um, sometimes it's not, uh, uh, you know, complex without with a whole lot of design, but sometimes it's 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 literally you know having a com conversation through um, you know uh, like design folks folks creating things or or folks you know, having conversation or folks being able to to write down things or, or have conversations in, in small groups. I, I, I really think um, you know 
we need to do more and more to think about the, the the different ways that we can bring people in. So I really really appreciate that question around the, you know, how do we make sure that folks of, of uh, different abilities are, are able to participate. The other thing that strikes me, I think, from from the previous you know question was, you know, I think we're often talking talking about different types of consultation. You know, so I think we're talking a lot about like community based consultation right now, and folks are organizing and thinking about how we how we push for this work. But you know, I think you know there's a lot of consultation that comes from let's say top down, government down. Um, you know, I think another principle to mention is is that um, you know oftentimes we're designing these consultations with like a predetermined outcome in 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 mind. So I think you know we, we have to think about you know making sure that 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 agenda is 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 clear but we're not coming with a predetermined you know outcome in 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 mind and, and really creating the space for folks to to you know come to the table or 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 you, you go to, to folks and participate in a process that's like really um, actually open and, and 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 free and informed about um you know, how folks are contributing and, and whether or not they they, they want to contribute last thing i'll stand to steal a bit of time is um you know, my, my urban planning background is, you know, what, what currently happens is a lot of rooms are, are now Zoom conversations where a certain segment of folks get to participate. Whereas right now we're encouraging, you know, folks like urban planners, folks who are who are in public sector, who are looking to consult with communities, to not just put tables together where you have one or two folks with lived experience, but, you know, really think about who your communities are. And, and sometimes, yes, go and knock those doors. Go right, go go right to people, so that you can ensure that th those voices are included and, and and heard. And I think that's an important piece. You know, when, when we're thinking about uh, you know accountability, is is you know, are are we doing it right? Are we doing consultation right? If we haven't really reached out and and and, and done our best to make sure that you know folks in in their diversity can participate in the work that we're doing. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, Sue, do you want to add anything to the question of accessibility and making sure that um, the way we do things are, is accessible for people who are neurodiverse? Um, accessibility is super important. Um, and not just sort of, it used to be that we would ask people to tick a box. Um, so are you, um, for example, if there's gonna be food at the event, do you have food allergies? Are you vegan? Are you this? Are you that? Um, or do you, do you need a, a wheelchair ramp? Any of those things. Instead of asking that, we've moved to just providing it. So there is a vegan option. There will be a wheelchair ramp at, at all of our events. Um, and if, and it, it sort of goes into the planning section of it. So if we can't make it so that everyone can get into the building or everyone can get onto. We've had huge problems in our sector um, with people accessing technology to get on things like Zoom. Um, we don't, we have certain kinds of community funding and, and things like that, that we can get a limited number of computers for people. But with a computer, you need Wi-Fi, you need the knowledge and the ability um, we're, we were super lucky and blessed that, that a staff member at BCC actually figured out how to take over your computer and show you how to do it. Um, so we, we had, we have, um, a lot of privilege in that. And with that comes, you know, the other side of that is maybe they have access to the internet. Maybe they have access to, to, uh, to Zoom, but that particular community member also has three kids at home that are homeschooled. And so depending on what time we put a meeting at, they can't attend because each one of the three children has to have some sort of technology to attend school. And if we put a meeting at a time where they can't access those, the, that technology, then we might as well not have them at all. And that in all of those things, we're sort of piecing things together. And again, it comes, we've, we've had to do consultation and, and we're, we're very cautious about the way we consult and we're very um, aware that there are 
like Paul said, a lot of barriers. And sometimes you just, you have to go to the person. Unfortunately, COVID. <laughs> it, it's been, it, I think COVID and um, consultation have really been not great bedfellows at all. And we're missing, we've had whole sections of our community just drop away. We don't know where they are and we don't know how to find them because we're still fairly locked down here in Calgary, as you guys probably know in Toronto. Um, but it's, it's completely different from what it used to be. It used to be we could find people, we could go to the drop-in center, we could go to these places and find people and say, hey, if you have time and if you have the energy, you know, here's a bus ticket, come see us. And, you know, don't worry about missing your meal that night, we'll have food. All of those things, we could actually do that frontline kind of invite and bring people with us. But now it's on a computer and I don't, we don't know how to access and it's it's one of those things that probably consultation in the past would have helped us now but now but nobody ever predicted this so <laughs> we're kind of you know flying by the seat of our pants trying to figure it out and it has become a challenge thank you um there was one other aspect of that question that i'd just like to draw out a little bit and that's the question of intersectionality and recognizing that we don't just need uh, solutions or we don't just need consultations that focus on uh, even as you were saying Paul uh, considering like black Canadians as a monolith for example um, that we need to recognize diversity within groups and we need to recognize that there are overlapping identities that result in different experiences so I'm um, it makes me think of the question of disaggregated data and how we're tracking either who's participating, who we're targeting, who we're trying to learn about. Um, but I know that that calls into question uh, a lot of things about what's done with that data, um, and the accountability piece that you've already mentioned, and how do you build trust if, um, you know, we don't want to just collect data for the sake of having data, but how can we, how can we do a better job of uh, collecting data in a way that um, empowers the people whose whose information is is being gathered, um, so that it it's a benefit to the community itself. Um, and how do how do we work to make sure that we can have that data so we can better understand what's happening, but in a way that um, you know honors the the trust that's needed to to ask for that information and, and make good use of it. Yeah, I, I think on the data conversation, you know, th that probably deserves its own its own conversation. But the, you know, for me, it's important to talk about what 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 kind of data are we talking about and and for what purpose. So you know, if we're talking about evaluation purposes to make sure that we are reaching out and we understand who who we're talking to and who we're not talking to, I think that's one type of of data and data collection that that's useful to make sure that we're being more responsive and, and, and being accountable to, to the work that we're setting out to do. You know, I think there, there is a broader conversation going on around um, uh, collecting disaggregated race-based data or other social demographic data in the context of um, health and COVID-19 to, to make sure that we're holding health systems accountable to to you know what that is and and there's so many different layers uh to that it's it's collecting data it's you know going and talking to folks to, to understand the stories behind what the data is actually uh telling you it's then actually you know after you've gone through that process of collecting quantitative data and quanti quantitative and qualitative data that you're we're actually in a position to now utilize that data to 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 in, improve on the outcomes that that that, that we're seeing um, uh, and as part of that conversation, there's an ongoing conversation about data governance and, and you know, uh, kind of goes back to that same thing. Why are we collecting data? For what purpose? What are we, are we letting the folk, folks know that we're collecting data from what that purpose will be used and, and how the data will be stored? 
Um, and then, you know, in, in the end, different communities have different perspectives about this, but who, who ultimately owns that data and has, has access to that data and who gets to tell the stories about what that, that, that data is, is, is telling us. I think, you know, as I said, we, we could have a whole long conversation about this, but, it, you know, particularly around the data governance piece, I think it's so important if we're collecting data to, to think about where we should be and, and should not be collecting data. Um, uh, you know, my philosophy is around the, the you know, looking at race-based disparities is, is you know, we're not just collecting health data across the board for no reason. We're, we're, you know, we're interested in a collection of, of data to highlight the, the disparities, particularly around how it comes to analyzing and telling those stories that um, we can't just collect and tell those stories. We have to make sure that the folks who we collect the data from, from are also involved in, in, in telling those stories and making sure that we're accountable to that. So I'm not sure if I answered your question exactly, but, but um, you know, for me, the, the data conversation is big and, and critically important. Um, and I think you know, I think it's, it requires us to take it slow, particularly as we slow in, in, in Muslim when you think about uh, the implications of what it is that we're talking about, particularly as we're talking about big data and you know um, the usage of that in governments and corporations, etc. The intersectionality piece. Um, it's it's interesting because. When I think back on how Poverty Talks has, has evolved over time, um, the demographic that I originally represented and I guess my children aged out of um, was um, family, family and family with young children at home. Now my kids are old enough to have kids of their own. So, you know, that that changed over time but um the 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 draw was um homeless lived experience and there was very much a void when it came to the rest so it was kind of um there was there was a heavy evident, uh, uh, emphasis on uh, the homeless populations and and all of those things but even then we started realizing um and and vcc actually realized and brought in the indigenous advisory committee um because the indigenous population is overrepresented in poverty period um in any kind of poverty and it, it didn't matter where you looked it was an overrepresentation and we went okay this needs to be addressed by itself like this is a standalone issue and when those standalone issues come up when you're seeing the exact same thing over and over and over and over you have to look at it and go this needs to, its own special attention so we're going to create something that can better inform and and honestly the indigenous advisory committee advises poverty talks as well because we need to know if if this is what is happening how do we best move forward and it's not a so we actually sort of consult them and they inform us on how best to move forward with that and then on top of that we see you know in, it depending on the segment that you're looking at um, sometimes it's moms, sometimes it's dads, sometimes it's men, sometimes it's women, sometimes it's youth. Um, something that I think is a consideration coming up um, is there needs to be a youth advisory committee. We're not sure how to go move forward with that because we're not actually allowed to have minors sit with us. Um, we can have them come in and, and do things with us like events with us but we can't actually have them at the table so that creates kind of a thing but we need to address that because um youth um that are lgbtq2 plus are overrepresented in homelessness and poverty as well so again how do we how do we move forward with that and we bringing all of those things to the table we know that this is true and we strive to reach out in places where we know that those people we we can get their their voices 
because if you don't go looking, you won't find it. You will find, you know, the, the typical, but you know, what you sort of, what you already know and what you already expect. But if you go looking, you'll find the homeless count. We do a homeless count here, like it or not, we count homeless people. Um, and it doesn't at all capture, you know, my community because I don't have a homeless shelter in my community. Therefore, the people that are homeless in my neighborhood are not counted in that count. So how does that represent anything? What is the point of it? Saying, oh, well, we're here. Well, good for you because you're not, in, you're not bringing that, that, the whole picture to the table. You're just bringing that teeny tiny little piece that you choose to identify and to go to and say, oh, look at how well we're doing. The numbers are down. Well, the numbers are down because couch surfing is way up, but nobody is considering the fact that we actually, for the first time in a really, really long, I said 16 years in Calgary, um, we didn't have um, panhandlers or anything like that up in the suburbs. We now have one at every single street corner. Um, that's a demographic change. Nobody, the homeless count does not capture that piece of it. So maybe there's, there's a bunch of people sharing an apartment somewhere. Maybe, maybe they're not technically, you know, sheltered or, or any of those things, but they could be at any moment and they probably would benefit for, from some resource, but nobody's actually venturing out into these communities to figure it out. So when we, when we look at those intersections and what's causing them and what's causing people not to go to where the resources are, you know that there's a problem. There's a problem with the way that people are accessing services and, and all those things. I know that I'm way off topic now, but <laughs> that intersectionality piece of it gets missed when you're just looking at, oh, well, we're just going to use this lens and we're just going to look right here and nowhere else. You miss the fact that we have, you know, community members um, living in, in, in amongst us that have six kids and can't feed any of them because, you know, things changed and life changed and things happened, but they're able to, to maintain their housing. So therefore they're not homeless. So therefore they're not counted. And these things make a big difference. And it's the intersectionalities of those things that we need to look for. Not, not, the, um, not the blatant in your face kind of things, but all of those, those little pieces like, <clears throat> you know, um, you're black, you're single, you're or your meaning you're unmarried, um, and and you have four children in your care, whether they're yours or not. Um, you work for minimum wage, which is well below a living wage. You know all of those things indicate that there's probably poverty there, but we won't know until we ask them and say, "What's your situation?" You know, and ask the questions and say, "Hey, what's your situation?" and and how's that going? And, and even more than that, like what, what supports would you build if you had the magic wand? That's all. Sorry. Way off topic. No, any, thanks Sue. Any, anything to add to that, Paul? No, I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I agree with the, the piece around, uh, you know, we, we all, as we're organizing, as we're working, have blind spots. And so, you know, I think, I think that's why it's so critical to really make sure that uh, the, 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 the group or the table, if you will, that's, that's working on planning and implementing, you know, is, is as diverse as can be. So, so that we're, we're, we're doing some of that bridging um, and then that, that asking and evaluating piece to make sure that next time we're not repeating those same mistakes over and over. That, that, that Sue did a great job. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I, I want to pick up too on an, another question in our Q and A box, um, talking about um, you know, are there different 
research methodologies that we might consider. So Sue, you just raised a great example of how having too narrow a lens of, okay, well, we do our, um, you know, our shelter count and that will give us an indication of homelessness. Um, so someone in the question and answer box has asked about uh, other methods that are being used like community-based participatory action research um, and again avoiding repeating the same kinds of research or as you have mentioned Paul kind of doing research that tells us what we already know based on people's lived experience so um, their question is whether there are um, if you have any thoughts on various research methodologies if I'm understanding the question correctly that um, don't always just center Western scientific method, um, but that privilege other ways of knowing and, um, and understanding. I think, you know, uh, first to answer that question, I've, I've come across a, a research methodology that is, that is Western, but it's, it's translational research. Um, and so the idea is that, um, you know, oftentimes folks are, are coming up with a research question, you know, on their own. They are, they're motivated by a PhD project or academic research or some other type of research or research growth. Translational research says that uh, before you decide what research question you're going to tackle, go and talk to folks about um, um, what, what, what the need is or what the gap is uh, and work with folks collectively to, to define that research. Um, uh, and, and in addition to that, another principle is this idea of, of really structuring the project in a way where you're, you're doing the, the, work, the, the work on the front end to make sure that communities involved, the folks who are doing the research involved, the folks that might be implementing the research are involved. Um, so what you come out with at the end is is less of a process of trying to um, mobilize, mobilize research that has been done in isolation, but, but you're, you're putting together the, the pieces on the front end to, to respond to a question that community has identified or communities have identified that is, is their actual need and, and moving that uh, moving that, 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 that forward in a fashion that it can you know uh, probably have more impact or attention because of the right folks around the table I think to the question of, of um, you know the, the, I'm, I'm not an academic, uh, you know. Even though I spent a lot of time in a, in a university, I, I think I think I think academic research methods are are, are good because sometimes we have a you know, yeah, there's a there's some frameworks, ethics, and, and other things that help us think through those things. But I think there there are also all the negative sides, and so you know I think. I think sometimes combining different approaches, so whether it's translational research or participatory action, community action research, um, really prioritizing um, lived experience and people's voices as 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 um, valuable as quantitative or other type um, in, information, and working in a way that that's really interdis interdisciplinary and 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 invites different ways and views of working. You know, allows us to get the, to the best results. Sometimes that means that it takes a bit more time to. Um, you know, get to where you, you 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 want to get to, but I think I think that's similar to what we've been saying all along. Is is really that you, you have to be thoughtful and and think about the places that we have to invest, whether it's time or resources, um, to make sure that um, the work that we're doing, you know, isn't you know isn't 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 haphazard. It is a really thoughtful approach about how we how we how we you know do some of this work in a, in a more meaningful way. Thanks, Paul. Anything to add, Sue? Um, no, I I agree one hundred percent with Paul. Um, you know, we we're sort of um, because of the way that that we work. Um, Poverty Talks handles the more, you know, quantitative, and Vibrant Communities Calgary handles the more qualitative side of it, and then the two are put together. And, and then it's sort of, then we all sit down and sort of go, okay, well, what did we find out? And they come with all their statistics and charts and boxes and things, which actually doesn't go over very well with Poverty Talks, just so you know. And then um, we come in with, uh, well, we heard this and this and this and this and this. So what we actually set out to answer was this question, but we found out that our question was wrong. And this is the question that we should have been asking and we should maybe go back and and try again because we asked the wrong question and sometimes that's that's just the way that it is 
but um, I think in order to to get a really good picture, you need to have that sort of academic side, like Paul was saying, and then you also have to have the lived experience side, just like Paul said, um, and put them together, and and figure. Then use some very careful ciphering of that, and read it in the way that it was intended, and th and then you get your answers. And I think just to add to that really quickly is is this this idea that this is part of the the, the participatory action thing is that we're not we're not just extracting information and analyzing it in isolation. Folks who you collected information from should be involved in that isolation to validate whether or not like this is like what Sue is saying. This is this is what um, you know makes sense. Uh, and, and when you do put together those, these things in a, in a research, I think thinking about diverse ways of making sure that 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 information gets out there. Um, and, and, and that, uh, you know, again, communities are involved, again, before that information does go, go out there so that they can see the final product and make sure that, like, this is actually representative of what we've said is, is, is critically important. But, uh, you know, the, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks to both of you. Um, I have um, one, I think, kind of last question um, that, again, uh, thanks to our attendees who have uh, shared some really great questions. Um, this is all fitting together rather nicely. Um, so we've been talking about sort of the, the research question and, and what's done with that data and um, having some accountability to the people to whom we're asking for that information. Um, I'd like to shift that question a little bit and, and ask um, if we're thinking instead about how we keep um, government accountable, for example. Um, there's all different kinds of measures that we use to, um, to try to understand poverty rates in Canada. We know that they're all underestimates because none of them give the full picture. But even if we use a full suite of, you know, we can look at health outcomes, we can look at housing, we can look at income, we can look at um, employment, all these different measures. Um, so I'm wondering if you have suggestions for what kind of accountability mechanisms um, might make it possible for people with lived experience of poverty and other intersecting forms of systemic oppression to, um, to claim their legal rights. So um, in our campaign, we always frame poverty as a, as a matter of justice, not charity, and that this is about um, people's rights being denied. And so we often talk about these rights that we have, but recognizing that rights are kind of meaningless if there's no way to claim them. So I'm wondering if you could speak to what sort of accountability mechanisms you would like to see or uh, you'd recommend that um, that could be used to hold governments to account, um, whether that's for their spending or um, for the policies and programs that they propose to, to address poverty in Canada. I'll take a step of that one first. I think such a big question again. Um, and I, I I know that so much. You know, so when I think about poverty in, in the context of Toronto in, in Black communities, we know a couple of things that it's concentrated in particular neighborhoods. It's uh, generational. Um, uh, it's characterized by high levels of employment for women and men and 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 youth uh, among the highest um no matter if you you measure it citywide province-wide uh, countrywide um uh, and then we have you know compounded issues of uh you know precarious work food insecurity uh, and you know a, a disproportionate burden of, of chronic disease and 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 you know things that that's not to paint a, a, a only a terrible picture. There's, there's a, there's a, you know, a lot of resilience and, and organizing and, and work that people are doing to, to claim their rights. Um, but I think it's important to be the picture that 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 folks are in a an, in a context where they're they're trying to live their day to day life. They're they're facing these systemic barriers, um, and I think we're we're often asking folks to 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 do ever more to try and 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 secure those 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 basic those basic rights uh, whether it's the right to, to education or good education or the right to to you know safe housing or, or the right to to you know adequate food um i think around accountability 
one of the things that Black Health Alliance has been has been advocating for for about 20 years is is the collection of sociodemographic data. And I know that data and, and measurement doesn't always tell the whole story, and, and we often know the stories by by living it. But but uh, uh, better collection of quality data can 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 tell us better about the, the size and scale of the, the problems that we're dealing with and whether or not we're actually having an impact when we're talking about um, implementing solutions. Um, I think the, the second thing that I, would, that, I would, that I would argue for is, is this idea of uh, targeted universalism, uh, you know, which we, 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 we talk about a lot. I think it's important for us, you know, similar to the conversation that we're having a little while ago around intersectionality is that we, we start to break down um, um, who we're talking about and, and how issues affect them. So, you know, we can paint uh, uh, poverty with a, a broad racialized brush, but when you start to break away Black communities from, from that broad racialized brush, you start to see the, the stats that I mentioned a bit earlier. And so if our solutions aren't getting to the general generational nature of things, if the solutions aren't getting to that it's concentrated in particular neighborhoods that have been disinvested in, if the solutions aren't getting to the fundamental root of anti-Black racism and how that affects Black communities in, in in particular, in their diversity, um, uh, or in its diversity, we're, we're not going to get to the level of clarity I think that we need to 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 hold systems accountable. I think you know. Last thing I'd say on on this front is communities do uh, you know, especially where I'm from in the Northwest, a tremendous amount of organizing. There's so many tables and and groups. Uh, folks that are, are trying to work to address their urgent situations and push for long-term changes. And I think, I think what we can do as people in society, as, 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 as um, you know, folks doing this work is, is to be allies and, and amplifiers of, of those stories. Because I, I don't think that government is going to respond out of the, the goodness of their heart. I, I think we're fundamentally dealing with, and maybe this is a bit academic, but like uh, a racist and, and capitalist society that, that values certain things, you know, outside of the individuals that are, are pushing particular conversations. So I, th I think it's important that, that we value the, the idea of allyship and, and we amplify folks says stories and, and we seek to to understand and, and advocate um where we, where we where we do start to understand particular uh, kinds of things and i think you know for the folks in in, in government or, or in positions of power the the power of listening is, is 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 amazing i think i think we spend so much wasted time you know doing 20 10 15 years of, of advocacy Trying to move the the Dow forward on childcare, or trying to move the Dow forward on on you know a, 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 an appropriate national housing strategy, or all the other fundamental things that we've been advocating for. I think we have to just have a conversation about priorities. And I think instead of spending twenty years um, listening to communities and then you know eventually agreeing that you have to implement what people have been advocating for twenty years, I, I think we we do really need to. Um, uh, deepen our, 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 our approach to this democratic process, really, really engage people in a much more meaningful way and listen carefully to what folks are saying so that we can actually build, you know, the public policy solutions that, the public policy solutions that will, that will, you know, address some of these underlying uh, pieces and, 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 and hopefully allow people to, 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 to claim their, their rights. But I'll leave it there. Can I ask a clarifying question, Paul? Um, when you're talking about developing, um, like focusing our advocacy efforts on, on really listening, um, are you suggesting that, um, say that like the advocates and civil society, um, that the solutions are, are there and it's kind of uh, incumbent on us to listen and form those strategies together and present those or, um, or do you feel more that government and government obviously has to listen to you, but just let us I, 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 I think I'm, I'm both sides is what I was trying to bridge was communities are always pushing against are always organizing um, and if you if you ask folks folks will have a reasonable understanding about what they need in their own lives right um, or if not a full understanding of what they need in their own lives they, they might not understand all the, the or we may not understand all the policy levers or the options that we can take to address those particular situations. But what really listening um, as allies or, or or folks in civil society, I think, is is critical to 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 that. But I was also saying that that government, um, 
I, I just I just think maybe it's a bit like existential, but I I think you know we just, we spend much too much time uh, advocating for fifteen to, to to twenty years to 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 move the Dow forward on on small things. I think you know my my this it's this this idea of like know better do better. I, I really think if people uh, uh, knew better, they would do better. And so I think I think the first step to that is 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 really listening. Um, uh, not just listening for the purposes of, um, you know, saying that we listen, but listening to really hear and understand um, the expertise that's coming from from communities in, in the diversity and, and leveraging that information to to build better better solutions that address the, the situations that we're that we're talking about. But uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Paul. Sue. Um. So, <laughs> let's see. It would have been six or seven years ago um i did a i did a presentation for on behalf of poverty talks there was there was an event and um it told me the statistic i, I was looking for some some st statistics around food insecurity and one of the ones that wasn't necessarily about food insecurity but came forward was that people in hamilton ontario were if you were living in poverty, the life expectancy difference was 20 years, 20 years. Here's the thing. You know what happened when they discovered this? Nothing. Nothing changed. Nothing. They did nothing to stop it. They did nothing to prevent this. And I'm going, okay, so the governments know this and we're all aware of it now, not just because, you know, but because I mean, I found the, the it's to, I found this statistic on the internet, so we all have access to this, and nothing changed for the people who are dying twenty years before their time. And I'm going, okay, so why? What was? Why did they bother collecting the data if nobody was going to use the data? And how exactly? Do we change that? So in a way, um, I mean, again, I live in Alberta, um, trying to be nice to, you know, um, so we just had a huge, um, I can't remember what they called it, but they, they reviewed AISH and that the, what they, their data told them was that we have too many people with mental health conditions on H. Like, hmm, okay, so what do you suggest for them? There was no suggestions, there was no help, there was no nothing else. It was just simply, here's our statement, we got it from the data. Well, who cares? I'm sorry, if somebody's suffering with mental health, uh, with their mental health, why would I not want them to receive H? H is, um, assured income for the severely handicapped i oppose the name the name is an issue but anyway it doesn't matter the point is that at the end of the day we have government who knows this stuff and at some point and not to sound overly militant and not to sound overly dramatic even but we as the human beings that are affected by these we are the numbers in the statistics once we realize that we need to weaponize it and use it against them to prove that or to get basically what we want because ultimately it's all fine and well for us to be collecting and having this data and oh isn't it wonderful that we just did this review and blah, blah. how much did you spend on the review like, where's that information? Because I'd like to read how much you spent on the review and how many more people with mental health problems I could put on H for that price. Just saying. Because at the end of the day, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. If these people can't get income anywhere else, do you really want people starving to death in the street? It was the same with the statistic about everybody started a push we're conservative so there was a big push here to test for welfare so if you're on drugs you can't get welfare he said well 
okay, that's great. So what is this, the statistic? What the other places have done it? What is it? Turns out it's like less than 1%, totally worth the $300,000 that they spent on it. But, you know, and at the end of the day, I'm like $300,000, how much is that in welfare checks? Like, or, or Alberta works checks or whatever your province calls it. How much is that? How many, how many years would that take somebody for the sake of less than 1%? which is a sad, very sad statistic saying that um, our drug users can't afford to be on assistance. That's a sad thing. But on the other side of that, I was like, so you're going to use this statistic and you're going to try to push for this. So what's the end result? The end result is that in your world, because I guess a huge number of the people receiving assistance are drug users, we're going to have unfunded drug drug users. You're basically defunding people who are dependent on a drug. So they're going to move in next door to you, right? Because they're not going to live next door to me. I was like, that's fine. But you're going to have very, very sick people all over the place in your own theory. But in that, it becomes, you can take these statistics and use them as a weapon. And I think the governments have been doing this long enough that we need to learn some lessons from what they're doing and use them as weapons against the governments because enough is enough. And I'm sick and I'm tired of, oh, well, we counted the homeless population and it's gone down. What? No, it hasn't. Don't be ridiculous. All you need to do is look around you and you know that that is not a true statement. You know, according to food bank numbers, our, our food, not this year, definitely not this year, but the year before, our food bank numbers have gone down. Okay, well, food insecurity certainly hasn't gone anywhere. So what is the number? Like, what are, what are you doing to create these numbers and how many people couldn't access? Is that the problem? Because in the... <sighs> We know what poverty does. We know where poverty is worst felt. We know all of these things. We don't need any more studies. We don't need any more consultation. We don't need any more of that to know what it's doing. So in that, we need to figure out a way to weaponize poverty for, or what, basically weaponize poverty for every single person who lives in poverty that they can use it and say, listen to me, government, this is my reality and you need to fix it because I'm a citizen and I live here. Quick anecdotal thing, we had, um, so a few years ago, I'm sure you all remember the news, we had a massive flood, wiped out a bunch of downtown houses. And I mean, I've been to Toronto, you know what downtown houses are like. They're very, 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 very expensive homes, very expensive. Um, they're all along the river, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of money, prevalent communities there, very expensive. And also the homeless population right next door. But we had floods, floods of help. There was Red Cross. We had people, we had, I mean, I put on rubber boots and went down and helped. We had all of these things happening. And at the same time, you know, everybody's worried and concerned. It's all over the news. Everything's great. We're getting it fixed. It's awesome, right? Fast forward to this year, June, we had a massive hailstorm. And when I say massive, I think apocalypse. Like it was, it sheared siding off of houses. Like it sheared the roof right off. Every window in the house was broken. But because it hit a community that is predominantly, or viewed as predominantly, um, newcomers, newcomers to Canada. Um, it was completely ignored. We had Rachel Notley toured once, did nothing. We had a couple other people go through, did nothing. Um, our local MLA, or sorry, counselor, brought some dumpsters, then did nothing. Nobody did anything. And we still have houses. That was June. It is now October. And we had snow yesterday. 
we still have houses that have boarded up windows and massive holes in their siding. Nothing was done because of the difference between the two communities. And we need to take that and look at these politicians and say, what is your excuse for not helping? Tell me, because one is a different demographic from the other. Is that the difference? Was it, was it that we had mostly Caucasian faces there and mostly non-Caucasian faces here? Like, what are the differences? And why haven't you done anything to help these people? Because we have houses that have no windows and it's snowing. Sorry. Anyway, that's all. Thanks for that, Sue. Again, I, th I think you've talked about just the power of those stories and um, that really, yeah, it's, it's not a question of not knowing how bad things are, not knowing how bad poverty is, or um, when we, we do report sometimes on poverty in Canada, we re re did one recently, and depending on the measure that you use, it's 3.9 million or 5.9 million, the estimate. But really, when it gets into the millions, like, does that matter? That, like, you know, if if you don't care if it's three million, will you care if it's six million? <laughs> so, uh, um, anyway, um, I want to thank you very much for your comments and and for those really powerful stories that you've shared and for your your own insights and experiences. Um, and I hope that um, now, as we take a look a, a little bit at what um, the two on this campaign. Um, is asking for and, and ways to take action that uh, folks will feel that this is a way to, to um, as Sue was saying, to kind of weaponize these stories and, and this data and um, hold government account. Um, because again, it's, it's not like we're telling them anything they don't know. So I'm just gonna briefly show, uh, show folks a little bit about the campaign and their asks. Um, so you can see, here we've, uh, our website is just chewonthis.ca and we'll take you to this website here. Um, so we have three main asks for our campaign this year um, and hopefully you'll see the conversation we've had today reflected in those asks. Uh, so first and foremost, we're asking for government to fulfill their legal obligation to protect people's rights to an adequate standard of living and end poverty in Canada by 2030. We feel that this is totally achievable. Uh, Canada has so many resources. Uh, I think for a lot of people, what we saw during the pandemic was if there's a will, there's a way. Um, suddenly there was money available to give people in need. Um, and I know a lot of you know First Nations communities and Inuit communities were like, well, where was that money you know, for the past hundred years and, and longer? Um, so, the government has already made certain commitments with regards to human rights. Um, we're calling on them to uphold the rights of Indigenous people as well by ratifying the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, but all these are existing legal frameworks, existing um, commitments that Canada has made. Um, and our current poverty reduction strategy has a target of reducing poverty by 50% by 2030 which again would still leave millions of people in poverty. And when you consider that poverty is a matter of, of rights and a matter of justice, then that's simply not acceptable. And uh, as Sue was saying, you know, even if we see numbers drop for poverty rates, or if we see numbers drop for food insecurity or housing insecurity, you're still looking at millions of people who don't have the basic necessities and who are, uh, necessities and who are facing ongoing systemic barriers to having uh, the kinds of health outcomes and well-being that we want for everyone. So that's our first ask. Um, we recognize again that poverty disproportionately affects certain communities that are experiencing systemic oppression. So we believe that rather than just having this national number of how many people are, li are living in poverty, we need to again use that data, use what we already know, the stories we know, people's experiences, and set specific targets to end poverty and improve measures of well-being among specific communities who experience those systemic oppressions. Um, if you click on these, you can see more details. Um, but essentially, we're calling for these targets to be developed 
in consultation and in collaboration with these communities to ensure that the targets are actually meaningful, um, to ensure that the targets have reporting mechanisms so that people can be held accountable. Um, and that they should at minimum meet the requirements of our existing human rights obligations um, and uh, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, so thirdly, once we've set those targets, we want to make sure that our funding is actually being spent on things that are actually making a difference. So again, this is something that's come up in our conversation today. We need the data to know what's happening, to know who's being able to access certain benefits and programs who's not um, and a lot of this again we already know so sometimes again we don't need another study we don't need another pilot project we just need to act on what what communities are already telling us um, but again that data gives us the power to measure impact and, and evaluate our progress um, so we've called for the mandating of the collection of data disaggregated by socio-demographic identities and to better understand the impact of government policies. And by government policies, we don't just mean anti-poverty measures. So what is the impact of our tax system, for example? Um, certainly it could be redesigned to uh, offer a more fair redistribution of wealth in our country. Uh, what is the impact of our publicly funded uh, healthcare systems, for example, and Paul certainly spoke to the different outcomes experienced by the Black community in particular, and we know the same has, uh, has been studied on of First Nations and Inuit and Métis people as well. So we need to make sure that we're putting our money into solutions that are actually having a meaningful impact for the people that are disproportionately affected by these policy decisions. And so this includes both these universal programs that are publicly funded um, and regulations um, on the private sector and labor market, rent controls, things like this, as well as our tax system. But it also means that we need to put money towards these community-led strategies um, <clears throat> so that, as Paul mentioned, that the solutions that are already among these communities um, can be put into practice. Uh, so those are sort of our three main asks. Um, we have all kinds of ideas about more specific policy recommendations and going into greater depth on all of these. Um, but this is what we're asking for in general. And uh, so I'd invite you to, to check out the website um, for any more information on that. Um, and I would urge you to please send a letter to your MP, let them know that this is something you care about, this is something you expect action on. Uh, we have a tool here, if you click on send a letter to your MP, um, there are both options to send one right now digitally. You can edit the letter if you choose. And there's a little form that pops up and when you put in a postal code, it automatically determines who your member of parliament is. Um, and the letters are also going to um, Minister Ahmed Hussein, who's the Minister for um, children, families, and social services. And um, if you prefer, and recognizing that many people don't have access to digital technology and internet, you can also print the letter or you can order physical copies of the letter for free. And you can do that in English, in French, and in Inuktitut. So we have uh, those three languages available um, for the printed letters and for the online tool, we have the English and French available. We also have an e-rally coming up on this Saturday, which is the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. And there will be some uh, representatives from the government uh, attending that as well. So we know that there are some MPs, some senators uh, who are joining that call. But we have a really great panel um, lined up. Uh, you can find more details if you click on the link to register. Uh, it will be a bilingual panel uh, of English and French, and there will be uh, simultaneous interpretation available in English, French, and American Sign Language. Um, all of our webinars and our e-rally are going to be available um, recorded afterwards if, if you can't make it, but if you can, that would be great. We'll, uh, we'll hear from a great panel about some of the barriers and recommendations to poverty eradication in Canada. Um, there'll be an opportunity for uh, government representatives to ask questions, 
they won't be making statements, they'll just be asking questions. Um, and attendees will also be able to ask questions as well. Um, we also have a tool to write to your local media. And again, if you enjoyed this webinar, there's still a few others. Uh, some are being led in collaboration with Leading in Color, which features uh, racialized youth who are emerging experts in their fields. Um, so you can check those out. And again, we'll be scheduling follow-up meetings with ministers and MPs after the campaign and once all the letters are sent. So if you can send a letter to make sure your MP knows you care, uh, that would be great. And we'd love to see you on the e-rally. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, so we've got um, a couple questions. Just I don't at this time have um, translation available for Long Day Sing Quebec on this e-rally. Uh, this is the first time that our campaign has really been using these online digital platforms. So um, we're very much aware that we have a long way to go in terms of improving our accessibility, improving the, the number of languages that are available. And so um, please send us your suggestions. This is not to, I'm not trying to take us off the hook here. So uh, we know that we have a lot of learning to do. Um, this used to be a postcard campaign, so it looks very different this year. Um, but we'd love to hear your feedback. We'd love to work with folks on improving uh, the accessibility and the impact of the campaign in the future. So for, for this year, we have uh, French, English, and American Sign Language available. Um, and with that, um, I, you can contact me if you have any questions about uh, accessibility or any suggestions. So I'm going to drop my email in the chat. Um, and with that, I just want to thank Paul and Sue again um, for this really great conversation. Um, I really appreciate the insights and um, perspectives that you've shared. And uh, if you have any final comments that you want to leave with folks, I'll welcome you to do that now. Okay, well, we can at least say goodbye. Um, so, so thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, again, I'll pop the website in the chat here, um, but we'd love to, to hear from you and would love to, um, to just show the government just how much support is out there for making meaningful change happen. So thank you again, Sue. Thank you again, Paul. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Thank you for inviting us.